Good day, everyone, and uh, thank you all for uh, attending this presentation. I would like uh, to thank uh, Drs. Hutter, Weiner, and uh, Rosenzweig for inviting me to participate in this symposium. I'm going to talk about atrial fibrillation, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapy. As you all know, atrial fibrillation affects a large number of people. And in this uh, lecture today, I will give you an overview of the most recent advances in this field. And this will help you determine which of your patients will benefit from some of the therapeutic interventions I will talk about today. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I will cover the following. I will talk about the magnitude of the problem of atrial fibrillation. I will talk about the role of anti-arrhythmic medications for rhythm control. And then I will talk about catheter ablation for rhythm control, which I will uh, focus on for the main part of this lecture. So let's start with the first part, which is the magnitude of the problem of atrial fibrillation. This slide is uh, from a study from uh, the Mayo Clinic. Looking at the projected number of persons with atrial fibrillation in the United States between the year 2000 and the year 2050. On the y-axis is the projected number of persons with AFib. On the, on the x-axis are the years up to 2050. And there are two different projections or two different estimates for the number of patients with atrial fibrillation. The one in yellow is a more aggressive projection. And this is based on the trend that we've been seeing since the 1980s. And, typical, and it's uh, fueled by obesity, hypertension, and sleep apnea. And if we continue on this trend, we will end up in 2050 with about 16 million people with atrial fibrillation. Even in the most conservative scenarios, even if this trend of obesity, hypertension, and sleep apnea, all three of which cause atrial fibrillation, even if they get better, we're still gonna be ending up with 12 million people with atrial fibrillation. So this is a huge number of people with atrial fibrillation. And it has a major economic and clinical burden. So let's look how other part of the world. This is uh, a map of the world showing the prevalence rates of atrial fibrillation. The blue colors have less AFib, the red colors have more AFib, and as you see, North America lights up. And in my opinion, there are two reasons for this. One of them is we have uh, probably better recording systems and documentation, and we have uh, uh, better ways of diagnosis atrial fibrillation, but also I think we all agree that uh, obesity in, 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 the, in North America is a major problem and that leads to atrial fibrillation in addition to hypertension. So uh, we all know that uh, AFib is a problem because it has clinical implications. Stroke is one of the most common and devastating com complications of atrial fibrillation. Individuals with atrial fibrillation are five times more likely to have a stroke than those without. And AFib is associated with increased risk of heart failure, cognitive dysfunction, and premature death. So let's talk about how we can treat atrial fibrillation and how we can restore normal rhythm. Here are, uh, this is a, one of the most important studies in the field of pharmacologic therapy for atrial fibrillation, and it compares amiodarone versus sotalol versus placebo. On the y-axis is the probability to stay in normal rhythm. On the x-axis is the follow-up. And as you can see with these Kaplan-Meier curves, amiodarone is uh, better than sotalol. But even with amiodarone, you still have about 40% chance of keeping someone in normal rhythm. Sotalol is half of that. And here's uh, placebo. So these medications, as, as you can see from this slide, are marginally effective. In addition, they have side effects. So even with uh, simpler antiarrhythmic medications, such as flaconide, you get uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias in 4 to 12%, bradycardia in 0.4 to 0.5%, second or third degree AV block, dizziness up to 30%, 
this one is causing drug withdrawal, 37, uh, 3.7 to 5.7 percent, and headache in 10 percent. And again, this is flaconide, which is one of the milder antiarrhythmic medications. If you look at amiodarone, it can cause pulmonary toxicity, depending on the study, anywhere from 10 to 17 percent. Neurologic effect, such as tremors, 20 to 40 percent. Thyroid dysfunction could be either hyper or hypothyroidism, anywhere between 1 to 32 percent. Hepatic enzyme elevation up to 40 percent. In addition, it can cause eye side effects such as corneal deposits or optic neuritis, skin such as uh, sun hypersensitivity and proarrhythmias, mainly a bradycardia. So significant side effects with amiodarone. And uh, if you look at other antiarrhythmics, if you look at uh, dronadarone, for example, it is uh, it also has its share of uh, side effects. This is a study looking at dronadarone versus placebo for permanent atrial fibrillation treatment. This, this was a PALACE study. And the primary end, end point of uh, the study was the risk of uh, stroke, com composite of uh, stroke, myocardial infarction, systemic embolism, or death. And here's dronadarone, and here is placebo. And you see there were more events in dronadarone. So based on the study, we, it was, uh, we learned that we cannot use dronadarone in, uh, in people with uh, permanent atrial fibrillation, probably because it exacerbates heart failure. So if we want to summarize what uh, the data has shown so far in regards to treating atrial fibrillation with rhythm control with antiarrhythmic medications, I think we can say the following that antiarrhythmic medications are marginally effective and they are associated with a high rate of side effects. So if medications are marginally effective and they cause side effects, what works? That takes us to talking about catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, which has become the primary treatment for this condition. And this field of catheter ablation started in France and Bordeaux in 1998, based on the study, when the investigators found by putting a catheter in the pulmonary vein, that as shown here, that the pulmonary veins trigger atrial fibrillation. So why would a vein trigger atrial fibrillation? And the answer comes from histology. If you look at, uh, this is uh, a histology study uh, picture of uh, the back wall of the heart. And these striations represent the myocardial muscle. And the myocardial muscle does not stop at where the vein enters the atrium. Instead, it goes inside the pulmonary vein. It invades the pulmonary veins. So the first one or two centimeters of the pulmonary veins are contain cardiac muscle, which can generate and uh, trigger electrical activity. So uh, this is a study that uh, uh, we did at MGH um, many years ago. And we, we looked at those, what we call myocardial sleeves that go into the pulmonary vein. And we found that they range from 1.1 to 25 millimeters in length. They are the longest in the left superior pulmonary vein. And more importantly, the myocardial extensions in AFib patients compared to patients without AFib are more common, show more discontinuities, more myositis hypertrophy, and more fibrosis. So perhaps this anatomic heterogeneity leads to electrical um, instability, which can cause atrial fibrillation. So once the problem from the Bordeaux group, when the, when the French group localized atrial fibrillation to, the, to one particular area in the heart, which is the pulmonary vein, treating atrial fibrillation with catheter ablation became possible. And this field started about 20, 20 years ago, and this is how it's done. The idea is to isolate the pulmonary veins, electrically isolate them from the rest of the atrium. So this is a CT of the pulmonary vein, of the, of the pulmonary veins and the left atrium. And these scars illustrate where the impulses causing a fib are usually are, and what we do with the procedure is we create a line of block 
to isolate the pulmonary veins from the right from the left atrium and that's why the procedure is called pulmonary vein isolation so electrical disconnection between the pulmonary veins and the left atrium so let's see now how this procedure is done this is from an actual procedure from a patient the only difference that it is sped up we do a CAT scan prior to the procedure that we incorporate into the op operative field. So this CAT scan is pre-acquired and it is registered to the catheter where the catheter is located inside the heart. And we start the procedure and you're gonna see a series of red points. Each of these red points is one ablation lesion. And we go and encircle the pulmonary vein to electrically isolate them from the rest of the atrium. We put another catheter that you can see on the right side of the panel. This catheter is circular. It has electrodes around it. We place it inside the pulmonary veins and we use it to test the electrograms from within the vein. So we know when the pulmonary veins and the left atrium are electrically isolated. There will be the recordings we see from this catheter inside the pulmonary veins once isolation occurs is different than before isolation. So how, let's see, we talked about the rate of success with medication. Let's see what the rate of success in patients and uh, who undergo catheter ablation. This is uh, uh, one of the first studies comparing medications versus catheter ablation. This was a randomized study. The patients with the medical group are shown in the dotted line. The patient with catheter ablation are shown in the, in the solid line. Y-axis is the freedom from atrial fibrillation. X-axis is the duration of follow-up. And as you see here, the success rate of keeping someone in normal rhythm was significantly better for patients who undergo catheter ablation compared to patients who are treated in, with medications. In this study that was done early on about 10 years ago, both groups of patients were tried on antiarrhythmic medications first. So in this study, ablation was not tested as a first line therapy. It was tested as a second line of therapy. So the field advanced since that time. And most recently, there was a landmark study looking at catheter ablation as initial therapy for atrial fibrillation. So take patients who are first comers and they were randomized to either ablation of atrial fibrillation or drug therapy. And these were patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And the percentage of success is shown on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the duration of follow-up. And as you can see here, the ablation treatment was significantly better for than drug therapy. So based on the study, which was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, less than a year ago, we, we believe now that it is reasonable to offer catheter ablation to patients with atrial fibrillation with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, even if they were not treated with medications before. There were also some significant improvement in technology that helped improve the success rate of catheter ablation. And this one of them is a technology called force sensing, contact force sensing. This is a the movie I showed you, the video I showed you earlier showing the catheter moving inside the heart rely that the procedure relies a lot on the skills of the operator to know how much pressure they are putting at the tip of the catheter during the procedure too much pressure can lead to perforation of the heart to a, a light pressure or too little of a force can lead to incomplete ablation lesions and just a little bit of reversible edema that will cause recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So knowing how much pressure to put on the tip of the catheter is critical. And the technology that allows to measure 
the amount of pressure at the tip of the catheter became available about five years ago. And we tested it in this study that we published five years ago. And we found that when you use contact force sensing and when you use it effectively, the success rate is for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation was about 86%. We even improved the success rate a little bit now by using some other ancillary tools. One of them is uh, high frequency jet ventilation. Another one are the sheets that the catheters goes in. Instead of having a fixed curve sheet, we use some deflectable curve sheets. So these are all technical details. I don't wanna bore you with, but basically with all those with all those technological improvements, we are able to, this is our success rate at MGH. We are going to, we are, we are getting excellent success rate uh, for, for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, about 82% after one ablation, and it goes more than 90% after 1.1 ablation per patient. As some of the patients who get a recurrence would end up with a redo procedure. Those are probably about uh, five or 10%. So if you do 1.1 procedure per patient, you will end up with a success rate of over 90% in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So let's look now at catheter ablation in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. So this is a study we published uh, recently, also looking at uh, the role of uh, force sensing catheter for patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. And uh, it was performed in 27 centers in the United States and Canada, a total of 381 patients. This was a single arm study. And the patients underwent either pulmonary vein isolation alone or pulmonary vein isolation plus other sources of AFib. And I will talk about that, just keep this in mind, we'll talk about what does pulmonary vein isolation plus means. So when we did that, we found that the success rate, which was the primary effectiveness endpoint of the study was 62%. And we also defined a clinical success of 80%, which was defined as clinical elimination of, which was defined as elimination of symptomatic atrial fibrillation. The primary effectiveness was elimination of all atrial fibrillation, whether it's symptomatic or not. Clinical success was elimination of symptomatic atrial fibrillation, and that was achieved in 80%. So why, which, which is less than what I showed you in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which where the success rate is over 90%. So why is the success rate for persistent atrial fibrillation is less, less than that in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We believe that atrial fibrillation is progressive disease. And when the disease progresses from paroxysmal to persistent AFib, you started to deal with remodeling, electrical and anatomical remodeling in the, in the heart which leads to other areas outside the pulmonary veins that can start to act as drivers of atrial fibrillation. So initially in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the problem is localized to the pulmonary veins with disease progression. Areas outside the pulmonary veins become active and cause AFib. And hence the success rate with pulmonary vein isolation alone is higher for paroxysmal than with persistent. And most of the research now is focused on ways to localize the areas outside the pulmonary veins that can maintain atrial fibrillation in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. The studies that uh, I showed you so far, looking at the success rate of atrial fibrillation looked mostly as uh, the incidence or the prevalence of atrial fibrillation after ablation and symptoms. Most recently, however, a few studies looked at harder, more clinically relevant endpoints. The studies I showed you so far looked at uh, the effect of uh, atrial fibrillation, the effect of catheter ablation on 
reducing the incidence of atrial fibrillation, but none of the studies I showed you looked as harder clinical endpoints such as mortality. And over the past few years, there have been significant studies, three or four studies that we will talk about, that looked at harder endpoints for atrial fibrillation, specifically mortality. And uh, we'll cover those, and these include the effect of ablation on survival in patients with heart failure. We'll talk about the importance of early intervention in atrial fibrillation, and we'll talk about the effect of ablation on the risk of stroke. We'll start with uh, the effect of a fib ablation in patients with congestive heart failure. This study looked at uh, pulmonary vein isolation versus AV node ablation and cardiac resynchronization therapy. So either pulmonary vein isolation or ablate and pace. And it showed the following. When it comes to ejection fraction improvement, PVI was significantly better than ablation and pacing. Ablation here meaning ablation of the AV node, not ablation of atrial fibrillation. Six minute walk was significantly better with PVI compared to AV node ablation and pacing. And quality of life as measured in the Minnesota living with heart failure questionnaire was significantly better with PVI compared to AV nodal ablation plus pacemaker. This was the first study that showed the role or the, or the effect of ablation on reducing survival. And uh, two other more recent study were uh, published. One of them was the ATAC study, was published in circulation in 2017. In this study, ablation was performed in patients with heart failure and implantable defibrillators. They were randomized to either PVI, pulmonary vein isolation, versus amiodarone. And here, is, here are the results. These are the kaplan meyer curves looking at the freedom from atrial fibrillation. Group one, which is the catheter ablation, was significantly better. Most importantly, over a two-year follow-up, unplanned hospitalization occurred in 31% in group one and 57% in group two. So there was a 45% relative risk reduction with ablation. In addition, there was a significantly lower mortality rate observed in catheter ablation versus amiodarone. And perhaps the most important study in this regard is the CASEL AF study published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. Patients with heart failure were randomized to either medical therapy, mostly amiodarone, or ablation. The ablation group is shown in blue. The medical therapy group is shown in red. Probability of survival of, of hospitalization for worsening heart failure is shown in the top panel. X-axis is the follow-up, 60-month follow-up ablations was significantly better. Death from any cause, ablation was significantly better. And hospitalization for worsening heart failure, ablation was significantly better. So this is powerful data showing the effect of ablation in reducing mortality in patients with atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Another area that has gained significant momentum in the next, uh, in, the, in the past year or so, was the role of early intervention in atrial fibrillation. Previously, if you get a patient with one or two episodes of atrial fibrillation, perhaps you'd have said, let's keep an eye on the patient, see how AFib is going to progress. But a recent study changed this or challenged this approach. And the study is the EAST AF4 trial. And it compared early rhythm control versus usual care. Usual care is what, what I just described, meaning let's see how it goes. I mean, you only do one or two episodes of atrial fibrillation. We don't need to do anything now versus early intervention. And early intervention doesn't need to be an ablation. Either medical th therapy such as flaconide or the 
or catheter ablation. And it was found that the usual care was associated with a worse outcome than early rhythm control. The primary endpoint was a composite of death from cardiovascular cause, stroke, or hospitalization. So again, this is a practice changing study and it's already started to change the field. And based on the study, our threshold for intervening and acting in patients with atrial fibrillation has significantly been reduced. So we talked about uh, uh, effect of AFib ablation on survival with in patients with heart failure. Here's the effect of uh, ablation on uh, with early intervention and how it reduces uh, death, stroke, and hospitalization. Let's see how atrial fibrillation ablation affects the risk of stroke. And uh, here's the study published in Jack in 2010, looking at the freedom from thromboembolic and hemorrhagic strokes in patients who underwent ablation. Patients were taken off anticoagulation, were randomized to either taking off anticoagulation or may staying on anticoagulation. And we found that if you do an ablation and you stop anticoagulation, your rate of hemorrhagic plus thromboembolic stroke was significantly better. So, so this is important data. It shows that when you do an ablation, and if you follow the patient well, you may be able to stop anticoagulation in some group of patients who do, who do, who do well. This is another, uh, uh, another study that looking at the risk of stroke or TIA after a fib ablation with oral anticoagulation use guided by EKG monitoring and pulse assessment. This study was before the days of consumer devices such as the Cardia Mobile device or the Apple Watch device. With those new consumer device, this approach that I'm describing here, it's even easier. So with this study in, in 2014, ablation were done and uh, the patients were either stopped anticoagulation or continue it. And uh, here, here's the freedom from stroke or TIA. And we found that patients who were off anticoagulation did better because their atrial fibrillation was cured with catheter ablation. This is a composite of five observational study meta-analysis, a total of 2,553 patients where anticoagulation was stopped when no atrial fibrillation recurrence was seen on EKG monitoring. Let's focus these patients who were divided into two groups, group one with a CHAD score of one and the second group, CHAD score of two or more. And when anticoagulation was stopped after ablation, the rate of stroke was 0.095%. And this compared to 4% percent risk of stroke in a similar population from historical data. So if you do an ablation and if you follow the patients with either EKG or uh, some of the consumer devices, you can stop anticoagulation on a large number of these patients and the risk of stroke will be low in the order of 0.095 percent. One thing to keep in mind that uh, one criticism of this approach is uh, that these studies were non-randomized. There are no randomized study to answer this question yet, but this is a practice that uh, we've been following on a large number of our patients. Let's talk about uh, safety of uh, catheter ablation. Safety uh, complications include vascular access complications, tamponade, stroke, esophageal injury, and pulmonary vein stenosis. We published this study in uh, 2017. We looked at uh, 41,709 catheter uh, ablation procedures. The total number of complications was 0.427%, it's so a relatively low rate of complications. And these were divided as follows. Cardiac perforation, 0.28%. CVA, 0.01%. Atrioesophageal fistula, 0.024%. Audible steam pop, when you heat the tissue too much and causes a perforation, 0.127%, death, 0.031%. So 
overall low risk of complications for the procedure of this magnitude. There are significant advances in technology that we believe will make this procedure even safer. And uh, specifically, there's a new ablation modality called pulse field ablation and the preliminary results showing that it is safer and more effective than thermal ablation. Currently, we do ablation with thermal energy, either radio frequency, which will transmit into heat, or cryothermy, which, will, which is cold. So this, uh, compared to thermal energy, pulse field ablation is safer because thermal energy has a chance of affecting the esophagus, the phrenic nerve. It may cause pulmonary vein narrowing or stenosis. It can cause to can cause char formation at the tip of the catheter and uh, nervous system injury. In contrast, pulse field ablation, the new energy source, has the promise of creating lesions without tissue heating and freezing. It is selective for cardiac cells. It causes, it creates small pores by sending high intensity electric pulse field to the cells. It causes the formation of pores inside the cells, and these pores are irreversible, making the tissue unexcitable without affecting collateral structures. Preliminary result with this technology has been, these are studies were done in Europe. This technology remains investigational in the United States, but early studies in Europe showed the following, that the success rate at, uh, at uh, after ablation with this technology is around 87%. So similar in, in efficacy than thermal energy, but hopefully with a much improved safety profile. So in conclusion, we believe that the AF ablation is superior to medications for rhythm control and can be used as initial therapy. In patients with congestive heart failure, ablation of atrial fibrillation improves survival reduces hospitalization and improves, improves symptoms. Also, I showed you that the early rhythm control is associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular outcomes and AFib ablation is associated with a lower risk of complications. And thank you for your attention.